Today we are in San Francisco in the AppSera office. Hi Derek, who are you and what do you do? I'm the founder and CEO of AppSera. Um, I just, you know, we're hundred and some people now, but we're still kind of in a startup mode. So I do uh, all different types of things. Cool. When did you have this idea for starting AppSera and what did you do before? The idea for AppSera actually came around 2012 and it was kind of an offshoot from some of the work I had done previously around platforms and platforms as a service. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about platforms as a service was the original uh, premise was to try to accelerate the deployment of mm -hmm. complex workloads. Um, and what became very uh, clear to me was is that just speeding up the ability to deploy an app and to empower DevOps is um, necessary but not sufficient in, in the long, work, uh, long term. And what you really needed was a trusted platform. And a trusted platform that was multi-cloud involved a lot of very, very hard problems, uh, in our opinion. Ones that we didn't see the market willing to take on, mm -hmm. right? You saw a lot of companies that would kind of spin up and do some things in a couple months' time and then try to either get sold um, or try to push something out to the developer community where it's kind of like a toy mm -hmm. or an additional tool in a toolbox that developers could use to try to hand assemble their things. Um, and that still exists, right? We still see that in the ecosystem um, both embraces and then kicks those technologies out at a very fast rate these days. But businesses actually need a platform that they can trust, right? That they can actually move into this next generation of computing where they can uh, get more out of their own existing resources. They can utilize um, not only one, but multiple public clouds. Um, and it's interesting that the public cloud, I think, originally started around how do we move from CapEx to OpEx? Mm -hmm. And who's the cheapest on the OpEx, right? The, the race to zero. Yeah. But what we've seen with the customers we're engaging with now is, is that some of those public cloud vendors have gotten so big that actually is working against them. And they're nervous to put all their eggs in one basket. And so they want the ability to actually do things in a multi-cloud setup, but they want to do it consistently in a trusted fashion across clouds um, and with their own private resources. And so you know, AppSera was born out of, you know, trying to solve that problem, right? Deploy diverse workloads, orchestrate them together, right? Systems are becoming more complex. And then govern them all, right? And governance and, and security and policy are all of these words that, um, you know, can be taken as a bad thing, right? It's like, oh, and you see people's shoulders shrug. And so AppSera's vision and what we've driven towards was is to make that as transparent as possible drive it into the platform that IT operations actually cares about and delivers to their internal customers and make developers happy, right? But all doing it in a trusted way. Derek, um, can you walk with me through the first 12 or 18 months chronologically? When did you build a product? When did you talk to first customers? When did you acquire them? So that I just have a vivid picture of how it went to start it. Sure, so the, uh, about March 2012, um, I went and, and did a design uh, on my own of what I thought we would want to build. Mm -hmm. um, at that point in time, I started talking to VCs, um, the venture capital community. A lot of time, um, seed rounds or some of the very early rounds are an investment in the founder or the mm -hmm. founders yeah. um, with a little bit uh, of the idea, right? Mm -hmm. And then as you go through subsequent rounds, all those rules change. Yeah. Um, but so in, in March of 2012, I was coming up with the idea, I spent about two weeks on it, mm -hmm. um, and then went to VCs, got funding in about April of 2012, put together the founding team, mm -hmm. um, and we met in June of 2012 to do the kickoff. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the vision, this is kind of the general product that I think we should build, mm -hmm. um, and it was very different from what a lot of people had seen in terms of a startup, which was, I said, we will build something that might take us over a year to actually assemble. Um, and, you know, VCs usually don't react well to something that they won't even see for over a year. But part of our value proposition was is if we don't take on the hard problems for our customers, right, um, they're going to have to take them on. And, and then our value proposition goes away. And if you look at the notion of, of trust, right, as, as delivered through a platform, which is what we actually sell, um, it has to take on a lot of these hard problems. You can't keep asking the developers to understand all of the different rules. How are you supposed to access the database? What level of security do you need there? Um, 
something comes up like a zero day exploit, you know, who's exposed, well, how are we exposed? And Deadman DevOps, in my opinion, has evolved in a very good way to allow developers to both innovate, develop, and actually deploy into production applications at a much faster rate than they were allowed to do. But don't mistake that for the trust the business and the company in general has to being solely with Dev and DevOps. It's not that they're not talented enough. Mm -hmm. It's that they don't have the, the cross-functional awareness in, in a lot of the Global 2000 to deliver that, that trust factor, and it needs to be in the platform. And this, this isn't as very different than what happened with the operating systems in the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. So if you kind of step back and you squint a little bit, you know, the 90s we had very simplistic operating system and as we exited, we had very complex systems that, you know, governed, um, you know, single computing resources, but they took a lot of things into the platform so the developer didn't have to worry about it. This is the same type of trend, it's just for tens of thousands of computers mm -hmm. um, and multiple clouds and multiple private resources and bringing them all together under a single fabric. But it's not unlike, you know, uh, the, the general trend in the 90s where a tremendous amount of function and feature set was driven into the platform, the operating system for a single computer at the time. We're, you know, essentially doing the same thing. And us and the ecosystem is driving that, right? So usually you innovate over here and you experiment. And then as we kind of settle on patterns and functionality and feature set that actually makes sense, those then get driven down into the platform. Does that make sense? Yeah, there we go. What do you think was the main drivers for an investor to invest in the seed round? Um, was it only the, the you as a founder, or uh, what was the impact of the, your background, what you did before? Uh, what kind of confidence or so did you provide to the investor to invest in a seed round, especially given that you said it will take some time until we have something that we can ship? I mean, that's a great question. Um, you know, Seed rounds and, and early stage rounds are mostly confidence in the founder or founders. Um, and so my assumption is that they had confidence in me to actually deliver on, on some things. Uh, I've been very, very fortunate um, throughout my career, you know, early in the 90s at TIBCO, really kind of defining um, middleware and, and messaging systems as a construct for building distributed systems um, in the 90s through Fin Services and Wall Street. Um, the recogn uh, recognition at, you know, Gartner analyst level of um, defining categories. Mm -hmm. and, and I was fortunate enough to kind of participate in a lot of that um, early on. Um, spent six years at Google mm -hmm. and so really pushed on expanding out uh, APIs to existing services inside of Google such that developers could get access to them easily, freely, mm -hmm. and with very little effort could actually incorporate these services. Um, into their own workflows. Um, and that's, that's an important thing to understand of uh, all SaaS companies are kind of going down that path. Mm -hmm. So a SaaS company has a presence, um, they have some data, mm -hmm. they start exposing some APIs, um, they might progress to, oh, we'll add a scripting language or an environment to kind of glue these things together mm -hmm. a little bit. And then you actually end up at the full-fledged application. I want to write a full-fledged application that consumes the data and services that you as a SaaS provider are providing that have a huge amount of value for me as a business. The issue is, is that if I do that totally on my own, all of the effort you put into your servers are always up. They're geolocated all over the, the globe. Um, and then I as a developer sign up for a single account and run my app, which my business is betting on, mm -hmm. in a cloud provider without having the sophistication to match what you're trying to do. When that app fails, right, the business sees that app failing and then they look at the, the service that you're providing as, as not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so early on in Google, we kind of got that, all right? And, and I didn't participate directly in Google App Engine, but I was watching what it was trying to do and what problems it was trying to solve. And we were doing the developer ABI, APIs. Mm -hmm. And so the developer ecosystem within inside of Google was kind of kicked off by, by some of these efforts. Um, VMware then kind of came along and, and Paul Moritz said, hey, you know, would you be willing to join VMware? And VMware, by the way, started right next to TIBCO mm -hmm. um, uh, on Porter Drive in Palo Alto. Um, but I had no inkling of why I would ever join, you know, VMware. But what was presented to me was come up with an idea that, that moves up the stack for somebody like VMware. And the idea was, wow, deploying applications, you know, into a cloud environment and, and 
with production quality, meaning it stays up and you don't have to do a lot of things to it, uh, was really a market that wasn't being served for the Global 2000. Um, and so the idea of going to VMware was is to solve that problem. And what happened was is that that part of the problem was a huge success in terms of what uh, myself and the team delivered. The issue was is that I really quickly realized that that's going to run out of runway. And that some of these really nasty hard problems that have to be baked into the, the core, the core operating system, so to speak, for, for um, data centers and cloud providers didn't exist. And so that's why in 2012, while the, the, the technology that I had worked on was taking off, I decided to leave because I, I really believed I could see the writing on the wall when this was going to run out of runway. And just making developers deploy things faster um, was, was, was not sufficient. If you would rephrase the value proposition that AppServer is offering to its customers in like 10 to 15 seconds, what would it be? A trusted platform runs on multiple public clouds and your private resources, brings them all together in a single fabric, and allows you to do things both faster and with less headcount. Right? The, the only thing inside of IT that's getting more expensive is people. Mm -hmm. And so anytime you can actually repurpose or save headcount at being able to deploy and maintain a speed of innovation within a company, um, companies are very attracted to that, especially when trust actually involves uh, security and policy and governance and all the stuff that they care about and know mm -hmm. they need to care about. But uh, being able to do that and still allow developers to actually uh, be very, very agile and actually speed up. Who are your customers and how do you acquire them and especially who is making the purchase decision at your customers? Most of the uh, target area for us is the Global 2000. Our customers come um, in lots of different verticals, right? So telecom, um, fin services, uh, media, insurance. Um, but all of them kind of roll up to we want to do a migration to another platform. Mm -hmm. So you can call it a cloud migration if you're going from on-prem to a cloud. Mm -hmm. But we've seen customers who are trying to move from VMware to OpenStack, so it's all private. Um, we've seen true multi-cloud, mm -hmm. where they want to move to a public cloud, but then they also want to tie in existing resources. And what's interesting about the public clouds is, is that the race is on now for class of services. Mm -hmm. So it's not as much, I'll pick you over another cloud provider based on cost, they're now looking at, ooh, I might really want to run this application to consume mm -hmm. that specific service, which I don't want to build on my own. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, one of the top three big cloud providers invested. But then there's something over here with another cloud provider that I want an app to be able to take advantage of that. And so that presents customers with, we have a cloud migration story, an app migration type of, of initiative, and we're quickly going to get out of control with the number of people we're going to have to hire or train to understand, well, we do it this way today. How do we do it in this public cloud provider? Then how do we do it over there? What do we have to do that might be different? All of these cloud providers do things slightly differently. Still the kind of the same workload underneath, but how you secure it, how you manage it, how you actually orchestrate it together and plug it together with other components is different from everyone. And so customers are faced with wow, we're going to have to hire a lot of people, and how do we actually trust that what we do there translates to everywhere else? And so AppSera immediately comes in and says, keep doing what you're doing today, and allow us to put a single fabric that actually is consistently enforced and, and driven from a, a governance and policy perspective consistently across all of these environments, so you don't have to worry about it. And so the ability to, to demonstrate, you know, getting an application on our platform is very trivial. Um, if you've invested in container text or, or Docker type images, it's for free. It already runs on our platform. And then to show a customer in under two minutes, policy dictating where that workload can run and moving it between you know, VMware, OpenStack on-premise, then to Amazon, to Google, to IBM software, to Microsoft's Azure, all within about two minutes with the, the system completely rehealing itself, the application always being available, that's very powerful. And, and they immediately go, that's where we want to be. And their mind is, is that it's going to take them two to three years to get there. And we can demonstrate to them that we can get them there in a matter of months or even less. And so now all of a you're looking at, I don't have to hire a whole bunch of people to do this. And my three-year commitment to get there, I can actually deliver this thing maybe in three to six months from a production-grade quality standpoint, internal to my business and my users. That becomes very powerful. And which professionals are you targeting? Are you targeting the head of DevOps or the CTO or CIO or whomever? 
Mostly we actually sell to IT operations, mm -hmm. right? So there's usually a constituent inside of there that's um, like chief architect and, and mm -hmm. you know, um, platform services, you know, those types of, of roles. Um, we have had, you know, CIO types who said, you know, we, I have both. I have the DevOps and I have these IT ops and I need to figure out something that these guys mm -hmm. can deliver to this group to enable them to do what they want to do at speed, but such that we're in a trusted fashion, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not as popular anymore, but like shadow IT ops and stuff is still kind of a thing with some of these um, larger companies that aren't necessarily rooted in the, the echo chamber that is Silicon Valley, right? They, they have a migration path that they want to go and they believe it's a two to three to four year journey. And us being able to quickly accelerate, demonstrate that we can do that, demonstrate that we're a trusted partner for them, understanding that their IT budgets, which is both IT ops and then you know, a lot of the development and innovation piece, you know, is growing maybe at two, three percent a year, yet the demands on the business are growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. And what the expectation out of that group is, is exponential, yet the resources they have to spend is, is linear at best with a very, very small growth rate. And so us being able to come in and show them the speed at which they can actually get um, a platform and applications and services migrated in this fashion, in a trusted fashion, where we can actually prove mm -hmm. why it's trusted. Um, that's been resonating extremely well. Derek, you said that uh, AppSora is basically a platform as a service. How is your revenue model working and what is driving the pricing? So platform and service is, I guess, the best way to, des to describe us. Container management, orchestration, policy are all words that you can use to describe us. I can tell you platform as a service itself is being redefined, mm -hmm. whether it's AppSera or, or anyone else. And uh, the biggest thing to understand around that redefinition, which we want to be part of, is um, you know, the, the, the developers have a preference and, and they want choice. Mm -hmm. um, and they're willing to give that choice up for short-term gains, but eventually the only choice that they care about or the only preference and opinion that they care about is their own. Mm -hmm. And so delivering a trusted platform has to be able to enable their choice. So PaaS, as it was defined early on, was you, the developer, don't have very many choices. Mm -hmm. The platform's going to do all this stuff for you, but you'll give it up to speed up. What we're seeing now with things like Docker and container management systems is, you know, the developers want to have their own choice, but we need a platform as an IT operations mm -hmm. group that actually um, drives confidence that we're doing the right thing. Um, we sell a managed service, mm -hmm. right? So we actually bill... Um, subscription base for the, the number of assets mm -hmm. um, that you use, whether it be nodes or memory, you know, okay. it depends mm -hmm. on the customer. Um, and so we sell by saying, how big of, of a platform do you want to set up, mm -hmm. regardless of where it is? So regardless if it's on-premise or if it's, it's public cloud, the pricing model is, is the same. Okay, cool. Let's talk about your advice to first-time entrepreneurs. Um, what advice could you provide for some entrepreneurs so that they can learn from your learnings? Eric? There's a lot of uh, great lessons to be learned. Um, and, and I do a quite a bit of angel investing these days and, and I'm sitting on some advisory boards and, and talk to a lot of young entrepreneurs. Um, coming from how AppSera approached the problem, it might sound interesting um, or, or counterintuitive to what we did, which was a very, very broad technology set that is addressing very, very fluid markets. Um, and we purposely did this and we were trying to build a very large business out of, of, of that. But in general, the, the best advice I can say is, is, you know, concentrate incessantly on what makes you different. Mm -hmm. And anything that doesn't make you different, don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, use someone else's technology to do it or, mm -hmm. or, you know, not outsource it per se, but don't get caught up in the minutia of saying, well, we want to deliver this value and it's, yeah. it involves all these things. Keep whittling it down to, this exactly is what makes us different and then maniacally focus on that and drive the value out of, of your customers. Um, you know, customer interaction and understanding you know, what you do well, but more importantly, what is the problem we're trying to solve for these customers and are we meeting that goal? Mm -hmm. Right? And that's not something that you're going to start on day one and then say, okay, we're good to go. We know what it is. It's a fluid process. Mm -hmm. You have to invest very, very um, early on and consistently iterate on you know, what problems are they facing? What problems are we making easier for them mm -hmm. to get through? Is it um, a bottom line thing? Is it a top line thing? Is it a speed thing? And, and be very, very clear on what those things are. Um, when you walk into your customers. And so even early on for, for entrepreneurs, um, 
the biggest advice I give is say, okay, well, if you want to do all of these things, but I only tell you you can do one, which one is it? Um, because I think, especially in Silicon Valley, but I, I've seen this now in, in pockets all across the world, entrepreneurs really want to do good. They want to solve big problems, you know? Um, and I think that's amazing. Yeah. But getting going, you know, what is the first thing that, that you saw when you do really, really well? And then you can grow from there. Mm -hmm. But if you grow and you have this massive, you know, um, undertaking and, you, you know, you're not exactly clear on what problems it's solving and how you fit into the market, uh, that's a challenge. And, and again, it might sound counterintuitive because Absera starting out, people who weren't in the know or on the inside were like, wow, we didn't hear anything from you for like a year, you know, and we were trying to solve some very, very hard problems. Um, and, and that's why. But also now we have a very broad technology offering um, and we have applicability in markets that are extremely fluid, right? PaaS is being redefined. Mm -hmm. Cloud management platforms are being redefined. Container management is a new market that's, you know, emerging even though it's kind of been around, but now the analysts are starting to recognize it. Um, and so making sure that you're constantly evolving and, and being aware of how you fit into your customer's problem set, what the analyst's expectations are, um, has to be job number one. What other patterns did you see on successful and not so successful entrepreneurs that you can share? One of the ones, I had a conversation just the other day. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs that, that I've seen who have been successful um, moving into the entrepreneurial type of, of world is they're extremely good at contributing individually. They usually are very um, controlling. They can, mm. they default to, never mind, I'll just do it myself. Mm. And, and I'd, I'd have to be honest that I was probably that type of person, you know, still uh, in like 2010 or so. I think you have to commit to empowering the people that you bring on mm. um, because the best things that you'll actually get done in life, uh, even uh, in terms of starting a company, you have to do it as a team. Mm. And it's very hard for some entrepreneurs and they, they, you know, they don't want to give up yeah. control. They don't want to give up you know, um, investing uh, in their people, so to speak, maybe, whether it's equity or some other things. And it, at least from an AppServer perspective, I've never regretted anything around you know, really investing in the people, mm -hmm. um, really pushing hard around things. Mm -hmm. um, even when we started the company, uh, I was by myself trying to get great healthcare benefits. Uh, we had no employees, it was just me. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone looked at me and said, that's kind of foolish because it's really expensive. And I said, only till we hit eight people. And the first eight people that I probably want to target are going to care deeply about mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. right? You, you know, you, you need to understand how do you get the widest range of talent. And, and talent always has a different understanding of risk yeah. and reward. Um, and even in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco, you know, people have families, right? People want that work-life balance. Um, and so investing in your, your people and, and making sure that if you're successful, they're successful, mm -hmm. um, do that from, from day one. Um, the other piece is, is that I, I'm not a massive fan of lawyers per se. Invest in a lawyer. Yeah. The first call you should do before you hire anyone or sign anything is, is get hold of them, right? Because you want, mm -hmm everything to be done right. You want to set yourself up for, for success, whether that be you know, potentially an eventual IPO or an M&A mm -hmm. or large investments. Um, and all of that stuff matters. And a lot of entrepreneurs are really, really good at the big picture mm -hmm. and really, really good at details way, way down in, in, in the weeds. Um, they need to make sure they invest in the, in the middle stuff. They don't have to do it themselves, but they need, it's, need to make sure it's being taken care of. And, and lawyers and healthcare and benefits and HR and all this other stuff that you might not be thinking about, you want to get ahead of that. So, so invest in that earlier than, than you would expect. Great. Derek, thank you so much for your time and thank sharing you. your knowledge. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. And next time you're thinking about starting a company and you know that scaling is very important. I mean, you can use capital for scaling and most importantly, you have to build an organization with lots of people. And then if you want to scale via people and organ organization, you need to think about pushing ownership down because in the end, if you cannot control everything, you won't be able to scale that much. Thank you so much. Great. Good deal. Nice to meet you. Thank you.